John told me yesterday he'd prepared a little overhead, and that inspired me to prepare a longer overhead in much smaller type, hard to read. <laughs> and I apologize, but this is the very last time I'll be able to fit all this information on one page, so for the historic moment here itself. And what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes is the history of this historical talk series itself. This series has its own history, which is worth recording, and we keep talking about bits and bits of it from one program to the other, but right now, when we filled up a whole page worth of programs, now's about the time to talk about the history. And actually, if you want to know, this historical talk series started with my boy, nine years old, playing with a boy down the street. The boy down the street was the grandson of Harry Husky. And Harry Husky, retired professor of computer science, I think UCLA, UC Santa Cruz, was one of the computer industry pioneers. He built, in fact, a Bendix computer, I think called the B15, which has been called the first personal computer. It was the size of a refrigerator, but it was the first computer made to be used by one single individual, and that was back in the 1950s. So I was working at Sun Microsystems. I thought people at Sun might be interested to hear what Harry Husky had to say about computer history like Harry Husky at one time, he worked in England right after the war, and his boss was Alan Turing, of, after whom the Association of Computer Machinery has named the Turing Prize, which is the leading award for contributions to computer science. So, so when Harry Husky had his one-on-ones, he had his one-on-ones with Alan Turing. Yeah. And a lot of people at Sun came, about 70 people, to hear Harry Husky talk. And then I made contact with, showed interest among people in the computer industry now in history. And then I made contact with Jeannie Trichel at Sun, and Jeannie and I started this series, Bay Area Computer History Perspectives. And the title came from Bert Sutherland, who is the brother of Ivan Sutherland, who himself won a Turing Prize. These connections here. And our very first program here was computing at Livermore in 1963, and that was over four years ago. And uh, George Michael, who's one of our speakers, is here today in the back row. One thing I remember from that program was John Ranaletti calculated the total main memory of all the computers in use at Livermore in 1963. The total main memory was two megabytes. And you look today, I don't think, know if you can buy two megabytes of memory. Like four megabytes is probably the minimum, and it's like $16 or so at Fry's. And if you think about that, that shows how history can really stretch your imagination, can lead you to see, believe the unimaginable. Because back uh, 35 years ago at Livermore, it was unimaginable that 35 years later you could walk into a consumer electronics store and buy all that memory for $16. So think of all the memory in use at Livermore today. Imagine 35 years from now, perhaps you'll buy that for $16. Unimaginable, but it's already happened. It happened once, so it could happen again. Our second program, Ethernet 20th birthday, and that was, yeah, was in a few days of the 20th birthday of the Ethernet, of the time when, uh, I guess it was Bob Metcalf first uh, used the word Ethernet in a memo at Xerox Park. And that showed the advantage of having a panel, which is the approach we followed through these talks. Because Bob Metcalf has talked who knows how many times about the history of the Ethernet. I think he's written a book at this point, too. And so for him, it's kind of a set talk, history of the Ethernet. But here we had him with three of the guys who worked with him, including John Schock right here in the front row. And that makes it different. It's not the set talk. It's not the talk that he's given over and over again. It's Bob talking with other guys who worked with him at the same time, each bringing forth their own memories, their own souvenirs of the time. That makes it different. That makes it special. So we like to focus on teams or panels. And the next two programs were about Irma. And Irma was literally the first computer designed and built in the Bay Area. So you can think there's a whole lot that grew out of Irma. And Irma was designed and built right here on these grounds at SRI in Menlo Park. Yeah. Right? It's sort of like sacred grounds here. <laughs> Just think of Irma, yeah. So you can see the history of SRI and computers goes back before the 60s, back even into the 50s. History of the ARPANET was Larry Roberts. And that could have also included Bob Taylor, who was also involved in the ARPANET in that early stage. Just what uh, Don was talking about here, the first transmissions. Sketchpad was Ivan Sutherland. Sketchpad, Ivan... He got the Turing Award, I think, for the 
uh, virtual reality work, and he got the systems or ACM systems award for Sketchpad. Yeah. Early raster animation. This was the Stanford Card Sons programming instructions for students to hold up those colorful cards in the football stands. And if you think about it, I called it at the time the largest bitmap display. Yeah. <laughs> it was all manual, but it was bitmapped, all right. Utah graphics in the Bay Area, and there we had Ed Catmull, John Warnock, Frank Crow, Lance Williams, that was a co-program, was another chapter. Now this one here, Floating Point, that was interesting, that was right about at the time Intel had some problems with Floating Point, so it was a topical program. And the, a key, the key person in the whole program was Professor William Kahan from Berkeley, who is an amazing man, and I guess you have to be an amazing person to master Floating Point, and he got the Turing Prize himself for his work in Floating Point. And I had his name, so I called, but Professor Kahan has no email, and he has no voicemail. He refuses, you know, right, we're all in awe, we're all envious, yeah. <laughs> so I called, and that's how you get in touch with Professor Kahn. You call someone at Berkeley, and they write down what you say on a piece of paper and leave it where he can pick it up. So I said, we were interested in the history program. Would he call back? So a month went by, and he didn't call back. And I figured, I certainly wasn't going to trouble him a second time. No, not at all. You know, one message was enough. But after more than a month, the phone rang one afternoon. I picked it up, and it was Professor Kahan on the other end of the line. And he explained that, unfortunately, the person who copied down the phone number had copied it down wrong. So for over a month, he'd been trying to call the wrong phone number. And the phone number was in a seldom used conference room at Sun. So oh, over a month, he'd been trying to call an empty conference room. And after over a month, he finally got somebody in the room who told him how to get in touch with me. But you know, that's indomitable. That's you know just persevering despite all obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. We like our speakers to be motivated and interested, but they don't have to go to that extreme. <laughs> then we had Dinah Book, History at Sun, with Alan Kay, who obviously was a whole talk all by himself. No need for a panel there. You know, just, um, <laughs> And Shaky the Robot, now there was a historic problem. I guess four professors and three doctors here on the panel. That was quite, and Shaky the Robot was on Don's slide. You know, that was a real contribution, the first autonomous robot able to maneuver itself around a very confined premises. And virtual reality was Ivan Sutherland and Bob Sproul. And that was a good name. That was Ivan's title, Virtual Reality, before it had that name. This is true, you know. People do things before names exist to describe it. Now, what happened here? You see, there's a gap about a year here. Well, Jeannie and I, we were doing all this out of love of computer history. It was in no way in our job description or whatever. And love can carry you so far, but not all the way or forever. And what happened here? The Computer Museum in Boston moved their history, historical exhibits, to Moffett Field. And that's a historical event in itself. And they have, right now, over 50 tons of computer history exhibits uh, at Moffett Field. And they are, I think, right now, or about this week, getting another 50 tons from Boston. So that is the world's biggest center of his computer artifacts, right here in the neighborhood at Moffett Field. So we combined with them, and now we have joint programs. And this has helped a lot, obviously, because now we have people working on the program whose job is computer history, you know, not just Jeannie and I doing it on the side. <laughs> so we had the birth of laser printer, Gary Starkweather, ILIAC 4, which is a program about a feature of the history of NASA Ames itself, right there, which, you know, we could present in the program on the spot with pieces of ILIAC 4 around us, pieces of the disk drives of the CPU. Dex and PCs at the History Center. And that History Center, that is the exhibit place at Moffett Field. Early user interface design at Apple, our last program. And uh, it was magical. Like Larry Tesla showed this series of memos from uh, August and September of 1980, in which what we know now as the user interface was gradually defined and elaborated, just in a period of a few months, through a series of signed, dated memos and drawings. Remarkable how things can fall together in a very short time. And finally, here we are now, augmenting human intellect 35 years later, with 
Doug Engelbart. Now, Jeff Rulifson is going to talk first. He wasn't able to make it tonight, but he made a videotape. His tape is, I'm told, just six and a half minutes long, which is why I took liberty of talking a little longer myself. Then he'll be followed by Bill English and Charles Irby, and then Doug himself. I'd like to suggest we hold the, have question and answers afterwards in the lobby outside, because SRI is going to provide a reception, hors d'oeuvres, and drinks. So I suggest if you have questions for any of the speakers, find them in the lobby outside after the talk. All right, thank you very much for coming. Let's see. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jeff Rulison. I manage the Advanced Development Lab at Sun Microsystems. And tonight we're going to hear about uh, some of the technologies and systems and ideas that came out of Doug Engelbart's lab at SRI in the 60s and 70s. Um, my experience with Doug started actually at the Fall Joint Computer Conference in 1965 when I was just graduating from the University of Washington and went to Las Vegas, expected to attend um, the Fall Joint Computer Conference, but met Doug and uh, Butler Lampson and Peter Deutsch from Project Genie at Berkeley, and spent the next three days with them, and went back to SRI, and um, had the very special experience then of going to work for Doug and spending years in his lab. Um, if we look back at the uh, contributions that came out of Doug's lab, uh, I. I think that you can, you can look at them in sort of three different levels. There's a, a number of technologies that came out. There, uh, there are a set of experiences and, and more abstract technologies that came out of systems integration effort. And uh, there are the bootstrapping ideas, which I think are even a third level. The, um, the technologies, I think, receive most of the attention and press. And it's the easiest for uh, people to latch onto. The idea of the mouse, uh, the very first hypertext documents, the first demonstrations of video conferencing, uh, the first graphical user interfaces, and, and even some of the uh, initial disputes in graphical user interface wars um, came out of the experiences of that lab. And uh, when you tell people Doug invented the mouse, they, uh, they know in a very concrete way what you're talking about. Uh, however, Doug did a lot more than just these simple technology inventions. Uh, the lab built large applications using these inventions, and not only built them, but used them in the laboratory. And that led to a lot of ideas about how one uses and structures and stores the documents, and the notions of email and the first large journal or archiving systems uh, using hypertext documents were uh, built and used in Doug's lab. And um, those experiences, because people today still don't have those tools available to them, I think are very difficult for people to, to uh, grab onto in their heads. But there is a, um, a third level of um, idea behind all of this that Doug has had. Uh, if you go back to the uh, booklet I think they're handing out um, that Doug wrote in 1962, actually 35 years ago, you, uh, you find a set of ideas in there that, that um, Doug refers to as bootstrapping. And um, I will simplify this a lot, maybe too much for Doug. But, but as we build these tools and we build the technologies, we can think that, that there are technical tools that we are building, but these technical tools go with human systems. And as we take the tools into our human systems, we change the way we do things. So as we adopt email, we change the way that we interact with people. We change the reasons that we have meetings, because we do things with email before we have the meetings. So we can, if we can keep in our head the idea that there are human systems and tool systems, and that we need to actually think about and build these at the same time, that there's a kind of co-evolution that goes on, then we could think about the idea of having um, uh, 
groups inside companies that could do this uh, and, and, and think about improving themselves in the way that they work by evolving both their tools and their human systems at the same time. We could even think about a more abstract idea of, of groups of improvement groups getting together and sharing their experiences and maybe even using those tools or different sets of tools to help them evolve and improve the improvement process. And we could even think about then the meta thinking and planning that we could go on when we think about how we would improve the improvement groups. And uh, I know this is very abstract, but uh, I think it's going to be the theme that uh, you're going to hear a lot from Doug tonight. So um, the plan is, I think, uh, that um, uh, Bill English will tell you some about the uh, technologies that we put in place. And Charles uh, Irby will um, explain about the um, uh, applications that were built and some of the experiences and knowledge that were gained from the use of that. And Doug will tell you about bootstrapping. And I think we owe a lot of thanks to, um, to Peter and Jeannie for uh, putting all of this together. So um, uh, I think Bill's next. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. This is really a reunion. I've seen people here that I haven't seen in so many years in the SRI world. Uh, I'm going to tell you just a little, uh, very informally, um, an evolution of the hardware on which all of this wonderful work was done. In uh, particular, I'll tell you about the first experiments we did with pointing devices, which really uh, proved that the mouse was a pretty good device after all. And then I'll say something about how we ran this wonderful fall joint computer conference. Uh, I'm going to do this pretty much chronologically, and we'll just see how it falls out. Uh, I joined Doug in uh, 64, I believe it is. We'd worked together briefly in magnetics at SRI, and uh, Doug had just gotten some hardware and gotten started, and I joined him to help him put this system together and make it work. And we had, at that time, a wonderful CDC-160A computer. That was... Uh, it was a little, I don't have a picture of it. It was a marvelous little white desk with lots of switches on it. It had two banks of uh, 4K words each, and they roared away at 6.4 microseconds. We had a, a 32,000 word drum. This was a big operation at the time. And all of this uh, computer drove a wonderful display. And if you put up that picture, I've copied uh, pictures out of some of the reports. So these are rather crude black and white uh, slides, but the first one actually shows you the display console that we had at the time. Uh, it was a large CRT. It was driven by this wonderful machine. Uh, in front of it, we had a, a straightforward keyboard. And of course, you see on the right the mouse. That is not the mouse we used at first. This is a later picture. On the left, I believe, is the first experimental key set. Uh, rather, rather a kludge at the time. That was the display. It had 16 lines of 64 characters each, uppercase only. And this was the basis for our early pointing experiments. We could, we could manage to get out about 15 and a half, um, a character about every 15 microseconds, which wasn't too bad with the characters on the display. That gave us just about a 60 hertz refresh rate. That was OK. Worked just fine. Uh, with that machine, <coughs> uh, we started off to do uh, the pointing device experiments. Clearly, one of the things you had to have uh, in, in this whole environment Doug had envisioned was a way of saying what you were talking about on the display. You had to be able to say, this is the word I'm talking about, this is the character I'm talking about. So the ability to point at something on the display was absolutely critical. And there was a lot of brainstorming going on about what's the best way to do this. Light pens were obviously out in the world. Uh, we actually got one of those from the, one of the SAGE early warning system operations and tried it out. But uh, out of that discussion came Doug's idea of a pointing device that uh, simply moved around on the surface of the table. Now, why don't you put up the next slide there? I believe that is the first mouse. And 
Doug is the proud owner of the first mouse, and uh, I'll take these out in the lobby afterwards and you can look at them. This is the very first one that we built, uh, and this was one of the devices in the experiments. It was a, uh, a hand-carved wooden box, and inside that there's a mechanism that is really two potentiometers with wheels that ride on the surface of the table. No matter how you move it, at least one wheel is sliding and the other is rolling. And it turns out if you design the radius of these wheels just right and you have the right surface on the table, you don't even notice it sliding. It works beautifully. And that was the first mouse. It, it uh, coupled to the computer. These were analog pots. We had a, took a voltage out of the pot. It coupled to the computer through an A to D converter. And then the computer took the position based on the analog signal and put up a, a cursor on the screen. And that's the mouse that we used to run these initial uh, pointing experiments. Now, let me divert for just a minute to the pointing experiments. Uh, that obviously wasn't the only device. There were others around. There were joysticks, uh, light pen, as I mentioned. Uh, put up the next slide. I think I have pictures of some of the other pointing devices. Again, this was taken out of a, uh, yeah, I'll run it up a little higher there. This was uh, taken out of a copy of a report. And you see there the, the one on the left is the joystick. It was a box and it had in it mounted a joystick and we used that in a couple of modes. The next thing off to the right is a, is a graphicon that we used. All these devices, by the way, just input a, um, an analog signal through an ADD converter to the computer. Uh, and then there's, there's the mouse again. Uh, the graphicon, interestingly enough, simply gave you a, a, a radius and uh, an angle, a rho theta output. It didn't give you a linear output at all. At first thought we might have to convert that to a linear output. After playing with it just a little bit, <laughs> nobody noticed. The fact that you, to draw a straight line, you had to draw an arc with your hand, nobody noticed that. They weren't drawing lines, they were pointing at something. So we didn't have to do anything with it. We just used it as it was. And it turned out to be a pretty good device. I think there's one more picture that shows a, a couple of other interesting devices. Yeah, the top one is a knee control. <laughs> <laughs> Another device that worked surprisingly well. Uh, it was a loop that hung over your knee. You moved up and down on the screen by raising your knee up and down, just rocking on the ball of your foot. You moved left and right by moving your knee left to right. It turned out to be surprisingly good. And I think one of the reasons for that is you didn't have to take your hands off of anything to do it. You just moved your knee. And that, that really is an ideal pointing device, if you can do that. Uh, down at the bottom is the light pen. We, uh, we gave up on the Sage light pen. It was uh, sort of pistol-like and didn't feel right and it was hard to interface. And this is a commercial light pen that we used. So we actually set up and ran a, a set of experiments on this, uh, this wonderful display with the 160A uh, to have people select targets on the screen, uh, varying target sizes, like a single character or a word group of characters had people select those. We measured the time uh, it took them to uh, make the selection, the error rates. We did learning curves. Uh, we did one of, the, uh, one of the measurements that turned out to be very interesting is the time it takes to acquire the device. For example, the light pen. If it's lying on the table, you have to go pick it up. So from the time you get a picture that on the screen that says, now select this, you have to go pick up the light pen and point it to the screen. Access time was significant in those. The mouse was very low in that. It was right there. It sat there. You knew where it was. Uh, so those experiments were fascinating, and they proved pretty conclusively that the mouse was the best device of that set. There were others that were good for one reason or another. Uh, but particularly when it came down to selecting a single character, which is the critical if you're going to do text operations or even graphics, the mouse was by far and away the best. Uh, joystick in an absolute mode, which you don't see today, where the, uh, we took the springs off the joystick, so where you, wherever you put it, it stayed. And that works reasonably well. The joystick, where you, when you push it, it accelerates the cursor, was the big loser in this operation. Of course, that's the little J key or the rubber pad in the middle of the keyboard on laptops today. Those aren't bad for selecting, uh, uh, controlling your workspace, selecting icons and something. Trying to select characters with those things is awful. Anyway, that was the experiments we ran. We wrote a report on those in 64. And uh, I guess the mouse really hit the world about 20 years later. How about the name? The what? The name. The name? Right, the name of the mouse. Who, who named it? Nobody knows. 
I don't know. No one knows where the name of the mouse came from. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> in the brainstorming, Doug had the idea of doing this, and uh, we got this built at the SRI shop, this particular one that you see. Uh, throw up the next, the next slide, I believe, shows the next version of this mouse. Oh, this is the underside of it. You saw it in that first picture. It was, a, again, a, a carved wooden box, but this time we had three buttons instead of one. Obviously, your fingers are, get idle there doing nothing. They get tired if you don't have buttons to push, so we did three buttons. And uh, that worked out very well. That was a good mouse. And this is the one that was copied uh, for semi-production, here, again, here at SRI, where we made a number of mice and it was used by the entire group. Uh, I'll divert for just a minute as long as we're talking about the mice, because I brought some other interesting mice here. I think this is probably the first non-SRI mouse, because when I left SRI to go to Xerox Park in 1971, uh, one of the first things we had to do was, was develop a mouse. We were going along the same track, and we had a display system. So this is a, uh, a much smaller mouse. Again, we have wheels that ride on the surface of the table. Now, by the way, this one was big because uh, we had done some uh, very general, what does it feel like experiments to say how far you should move your hand relative to how far the cursor goes on the screen. And that kind of roughly fell out two to one. Uh, these potentiometers in this have stops in them. They reach the end. So the diameter of the wheel is determined by how far you want to move your hand to get the cursor across the screen. That's why that's so big. Uh, when we did this at SRI, we used uh, uh, a little cage with a light bulb in it and, and pulses. So we could make it as small as we wanted to. And this was just sort of evolved as a good size that fit the hand. Again, three buttons this time ranged up and down since the space was a little less. That was number, that was the second one. And then everyone has ball mice today. A year or so later at Park, we took the same basic mouse idea and uh, Ron Ryder at the time devised the idea of putting a, a ball on it and having your uh, motion sensors ride on the side of the ball. Uh, <clears throat> it leads to a cheaper mechanism. It, it didn't feel any better, as far as I'm concerned. And the wheels slide just fine. But this is the ball mouse. Again, three buttons. And then again, evolved at, uh, at Xerox Park to uh, probably the first optical mouse, which was this one. By this time, the, uh, the marketing forces were beginning to say it's going to hard be, get, be difficult to get people to use that many buttons. <laughs> so we dropped the two buttons. And that's the two-button mouse. And this was a really neat mouse. It's an optical mouse. has two little LEDs inside. And uh, you run it on a textured surface. We made little... Uh, cardboard pads with dots on them, but it'll run on anything. It'll run on a piece of newspaper, or a pair of plaid pants, anything. <laughs> it's surprising. That's, that was a nice little mouse. Anyway, that's just a, a little diversion into how the mouse evolved after SRI, because I sort of pushed it along at Park and in those directions. Uh, let's see, in 65, <coughs> I believe it was, uh, we just, the CDC 160A was quite limiting, and we switched to a CDC 3100. It was a faster, more capable machine. We had a better character generator. We could get upper and lower case on the screen, use the same display, but it was a, a 3100, and that expanded things quite a bit. By the way, another aside, this was, this was all done. We were in a, uh, one of the temporary buildings at SRI, uh, just the other side of the engineering building, and this was the era of uh, large computers and raised floors in the computer room, of course, so you could run cables under it. Well, we had the most flexible raised floor you can imagine. We were in the old building with a wooden floor, and when we wanted to run cables, we got out the saw. We could put it anywhere we wanted. <laughs> and that worked beautifully. Uh, I believe it was, what year did we move into the engineering building? 66 or something like that. But we had the 3100. I remember installing the 3100 in the temporary building with all the holes we cut in the floor. Uh, 67 was the big difference. We, uh, that's when we switched to the 940, when we got a serious time sharing system and could have more than one display. Uh, I, most of you probably know the 940 came out of uh, 
came out of Berkeley, really. It was a time-sharing modification done to an SDS machine. Uh, that was a, a more serious machine. Let's see, I have some notes about it. It had four 16K banks of 24-bit words. Uh, it had some fairly fast drums on it. Oh, and at one point, a little later on, we put on a, a, a disk file. This was a Bryant uh, 4061 disk file. Disk file. It had 42, uh, 42 million words on it, 24-bit words again. Uh, let's see, it had uh, 185 millisecond access time, 43K words per second. It was a big machine. It had six platters, three feet in diameter. <laughs> when you damaged a platter, somebody got to take it home for a coffee table. And uh, it was a rather heavy, and I was just calculating the other day that uh, given the weight of that thing, we were able to get about 250 kilob kilobits, uh, kilobytes per pound out of the machine, <laughs> which is uh, an interesting number. It was extremely heavy. I think the biggest, uh, uh, one of the best things we did, or the biggest uh, innovations we did on that 940 was the display system. Clearly, we wanted to have multiple users on it. That's why we had a time-sharing system. And to get flexibility, what we ended up doing was putting, a, uh, putting racks of CRTs in the computer room. This was made by a company called Tasker at the time. There were two systems. Each one drove 12 CRTs. They were little five-inch flat-face CRTs. And in front of each of those was mounted a video camera, 875 line camera. We thought of higher resolution. 875 seemed to be the best compromise. We could get commercial cameras. I think they were GE cameras. And mounted a camera in front of each of those displays. And this gave us a video signal, which was the display. And that we could take anywhere. And why don't you th put up that one of those next slides, if you would, Peter? I think that's a picture of a console. Yeah. Uh, this let us now take, take this video signal and move it out into the office environment instead of the computer room environment, because we weren't limited by distance. And that was a, a major breakthrough. Then we could build what was really, I think, the first personal workstation. Uh, we had video driving the display, the key set you see on the left. Uh, Doug actually brought a key set that I can show you here. This is the five-finger key set. Uh, you've probably all heard of it. It's a, it's a cording input device. You can actually type alphanumerics on it by cording with your fingers. Uh, it's a very interesting input device. Why it never caught on is a whole different story. But the, uh, the mouse, the key set, uh, were carried back uh, to the computer room again, uh, primarily through A to D converter. We were still using that on the mouse. But these workstations now we could put anywhere. And that was a big breakthrough. Uh, the 940 didn't really support as many as we would like. We couldn't support, we couldn't support 12 workstations at any reasonable rate. We could get up to six. I believe it was. I'll put up the next slide there. I have a slide showing several of the different workstation environments that we tried. Uh, this, is the, this is the one we finally ended up with, which is like today's office, desk and side table. It's a wonderful one. Try the next one, see what you have there. <coughs> we went through a period in the, uh, in the early 60s then of, uh, ah, yes. There's even Charles Irby in that picture. Uh, this was the, uh, the Herman Miller console. Uh, Herman Miller research was interested in developing uh, office furniture at the time, and we got them interested in the program. I think Doug got them interested in the program. And they came in and designed a, a console. There's a, it's a special, uh, the desk that you see there is mounted on the chair, and you wheel up the TV set in front of it, and you have room for the key set and the mouse. Of course, you don't have room for any paper. At the time, maybe some people thought it would be paperless society. It didn't turn out that way. <laughs> See if there's one. Is there one more console picture there? I think that's the last one. Pardon? I think that's the last one. Okay, that's it. Anyway, we added a number of different consoles, and uh, at the time, people were. Uh, uh, it was a fairly free, mo free flowing movement, and people were interested in experimenting with different positions and so on. So we had we had that table that you saw there. Uh, which was a fairly straightforward way of doing it, and the, and the desk and side table. We also had uh, stand-up terminals. We had terminals where you would, would kneel on the, on the screen in a Japanese style, kneel in front of the screen in Japanese style, 
So we were able to do a, a whole range of those. That, uh, <clears throat> the other thing, that obviously, that the video allowed us to do was the uh, FJCC presentation, and I'll get to that in a minute. I just had another few other notes about uh, things on the 940. Uh, we had a lot of problems with those displays. They worked, but they took a lot of maintenance. I wouldn't like to do that again. They actually had vacuum tubes in the cameras. And as, as was mentioned earlier, we did connect that machine to the ARPA network. That was the initial ARPA. had 14 contractors, and we're, we were one of the 14 contractors and had that on the, uh, on the 940. Uh, the big, let me switch to the FJCC show, and then I will, I will quit. I'm probably running too long here. Uh, the FJCC, FJCC show was obviously a, a, a major event. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that developed. I, Doug was chairman of a session. Uh, he was throwing out ideas. What could we, could we demonstrate something? Could we do something like that? And uh, I said, well, why don't we see what we can do? We have video signals. And it just kind of grew and evolved. And I realized, fine, we could really do this. We could, we could actually send our video signals to the conference hall in San Francisco and hook the whole thing up. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we rented uh, video circuits from Pacific Bell at the time. They put a, uh, on the roof of the building over there, they put a transmitter. They bounced off of a, an active repeater up on Skyline Boulevard straight to the Civic Center in San Francisco. We had two complete parallel channels taking video and audio up to the show. We had two 1200 baud lines bringing mouse information and key set information back to the computer. Uh, we had, uh, obviously, if we were going to do, first of all, we were going to do a demonstration booth. That was easy. We could have TV terminals in it. We wanted to do a really big screen for a session that Doug was chairing. And we found that we could get an IDA4 projector. We borrowed one from Ames Lab. The IDA4 projector is a wonderful device. It's an arc projector. We had a 40-foot screen, and you need an arc projector to cover a 40-foot screen with any brilliance. And we got an IDA4. The IDA4 is a an arc projector that projects light through a, a glass screen that is coated with oil. And the electron beam deflects the oil enough so that uh, the light does not, uh, then it has to pass through a, a grating. And the screen moves and there's a wiper blade so that each time you rewrite you have a clean oil surface. And it's an incredible sounding Goldberg, but it works. <laughs> and it worked beautifully. We got it from names, and we had to learn how to manage this thing. It all has to run in a vacuum, of course. You had to keep your vacuum up. You had to adjust it very carefully. A big machine. It stood about so big. And uh, we ran it at SRI for some time and decided we thought we would do this. Uh, we had redundancy in the video channels and everything else. We didn't have redundancy in that. I've often wondered what Doug would do if that Ida had failed, and he was sitting up there in front of that room full of people. <laughs> but it didn't fail. It worked beautifully. Uh, we had the two links, one, we got two really for redundancy. The second link then we used for live video and we were able to, uh, we got a simple-minded mixer. Not simple-minded at the time, but it let us do uh, split screens and corner inserts, uh, nothing fancy. And we were able to show people working at SRI, show their faces on the screen as well as what they were doing uh, on the display, because the display image is what we were showing. The IDA4 we could set to 875 lines, so we just drove our video right into the IDA4. Uh, and that was really was the heart of how we managed to pull off that FJCC presentation. That, uh, it, it came off beautifully. There were a lot of good people supporting that. Ed Vanderbeek was running the Vita, Ida 4. I don't think he's here tonight. I don't know where he is these days. But uh, it was quite, a, quite an effort, and a lot of people got behind it. And it was a major event. Uh, we did it again the next year at, um, what was the conference? The Information, Society, Information Processing Society. Again, we're, by this time we were experienced. We, it was nothing to it. <laughs> but uh, I believe Charles is going to show you a little video of, the, uh, of one of these conferences. And uh, the whole video is available if anyone is interested at some time, I'm sure. Uh, that's about it. I left, um, left the group in uh, 1970. I believe it was 70, yes. We just switched to a PDP-10 that really provided a much, much more capability. And, uh, I left to join Xerox Park, and uh, the history after that, someone else will have to carry on. So I'll turn it over to uh, Charles Irby. And 
and uh, talk about the contributions that I think the Augmentation Research Center uh, made to the, to the industry. And some of those ideas transferred to Xerox PARC, I'll talk a bit to that. Um, Jeff, Bill, and I all ended up going to Xerox PARC, uh, so a lot of this work, in fact, carried on there in, in a different vein. So we'll talk a bit about that, and then I'll talk a, a little bit about the World Wide Web, and then uh, close with some conclusions. So the next slide um, just explains a little bit about this video. Now, I, uh, I had actually set this up so that I could fast forward over a little bit of it to, to save some time. Uh, it turns out the equipment here uh, doesn't allow me to do that. So it's going to take a little bit longer than, than I had uh, expected. But uh, So we'll, we'll watch about what will probably turn out to be nine or ten minutes of, of this videotape. Uh, as Bill indicated, to do this, we ended up having to take the video image off the five-inch CRTs, put it through analog video and microwave, and show it on the projector, as Bill just described. To make this videotape, however, what we did was actually convert the video to 35 millimeter film, and then turn it back into video. So there's a little bit of loss of uh, integrity as, as a result of that, and you'll see a few places where it, where it uh, loses sync and so forth. And you'll also notice one place toward the end of it um, where the display system actually more or less craps out and the image sort of almost uh, goes away, uh, but it, it managed to uh, come back. Uh, this video conferencing that, that Bill mentioned was actually uh, essentially a trick of the fact that we were using analog video and we could do corner inserts to see the other person. But it, even today, you can't do video conferencing uh, the way you'll see in this 30-year-old in this uh, demonstration. Uh, another thing that, this, that you'll see in here, and I'd like you to keep in mind, is that e even though there's a, a point that's being made from the discussion, just think about the integration of text and graphics that was happening 30 years ago. And certainly there's a lot of that today, but I think I, I at least at that time would have predicted that we'd be much farther along uh, that trajectory than we are today. And obviously, there's a lot of discussion and use of the hypermedia and structured documents uh, that Doug, will, Doug and others will go through in the, in the demonstration. And again, you'll notice sometimes that Doug's sort of looking up, and that's because there was this 20 by 40 foot screen behind him that everybody in the auditorium was seeing, and, and he was sort of seeing what, trying to see what they were seeing, even though it was actually on the screen as well. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to, to ask you to keep in mind that this was a 90 minute live demonstration 29 years ago as you watch this, because some of the ideas uh, are still very powerful today. Okay, let's roll the video. I hope you'll go along with this rather unusual setting and the fact that I remain seated when I get introduced and the fact that I'm going to come to you mostly through this medium here for the rest of the show. And I should tell you that I'm backed up by quite a staff of people between here and Menlo Park, where Stanford Research is located, some 30 miles south of here. And uh, if everyone else does their job well, it will be very interesting, I think. <laughs> the research program that I'm going to describe to you is quickly characterizable by saying, if in your office you as an intellectual worker were supplied with a computer display backed up by a computer that was alive for you all day and was instantly responsible, responsive, <laughs> instantly responsive to every action you had, how much value could you derive from that? Well, this basically characterizes what we've been pursuing for many years in what we call the Augmented Human and Life Research Center at Stanford Research Institute. So look what else we can do here. I've got this file that's structured if I want to see what's in there, I can walk down the hierarchy levels and see or return. But there's another thing I can do. There's a root type that I have here. So here, I'm afraid I'll need a different picture of you. <laughs> so here's what I do with a picture drawing capability. Here's a slight map if I start from work. And here's the route I seem to have to go to to pick up all the materials. And that's my plan for getting home tonight. But if I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that. And oh, I see, overdue books and all. Well, there was a statement there with that name on it. Go back. What if I, what am I supposed to pick up at the drugstore? Hmm, I see, you understand. All right. Mark it. Oh, I've already seen that by the snow. 
like that. And, gee, that's too much. Anyway, so we have this feature that structure our material hierarchically, being able to move around it very well. When we get a hierarchy, such as I can show you here now, I can do things if I want to just say, I'd like to interchange produce and canned materials. Bingo. And they're all numbered like if I care to look. Interchanging them very quickly. Cans are going to get get interchanged with produce. They do it and all gets renumbered. So I have ways of studying over, making different views, moving around, going to specified points, and modifying the structure. At the same time, I see that I have a repertoire of different entities, like character, knock off that character, replace the character, make that P. So I have entities of all sorts that I can say I want to do operations on, and this basic structure I can move over and study and get about very quickly. So that is the essence now. That's the essence of the tool we have, a lot of details that I've left out for you. And now I'd like to stop a minute and just make sure you understand we're shifting from illustrative material to the real working stuff, in case you wouldn't recognize it otherwise. We've had, uh, we use this tool to do our daily work, and it's, our system has been built, this time sharing system, for about six months now, it's been working. And in that time, we've gone from a day one console, we're getting about six working now, with 12, six more due the rest of spring. This is our fourth computer in which we've had this kind of a system, so we've learned a lot about the user features we want, and how to be fairly skillful with this next step about learning how, when you're faced with having this in your office all day, as I now do, in a very exciting sense, how do you put that to work for yourself? How do you organize your files? What kind of things do you do? So to get going on this, let's switch away from the tool we have here and talk about some of the general features of the program, some of the ways it's built, and get back a little later to the nature of, the, of uh, our usage of it. So that program involves about 17 people together with the special laboratory facilities we have. It's sponsored by government agencies exclusively, ARPA, NASA, and RIDC now, and in the past, AFOSR and ESD, and these were the people that first grub staked us many years ago. Right. And it's been a goal-oriented pursuit for many years, and I think we can just go off and get a quick little picture I sketched to show this is the staffing over the years from 1950 on, and it's had slightly bumpy history. During these years, there was only one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I go back to where I was and say, let's continue on in this file. That link took me out to a different file, to a statement, to that view, and I jump back to this file where I was, and now within this file, I make a link to another to say, the HIRC is pursuing these goals basic goal to improve the effectiveness with which individuals and organizations work at intellectual tasks. What does their effectiveness involve then? Better solutions, faster solutions, solutions to more complex problems, with better use of human capabilities. Really thinking about that. But a corollary goal is, besides improving the effectiveness, to develop a system-oriented discipline for designing the means by which greater effectiveness is achieved. It's very important to us. The approach for this should result in the system-oriented discipline. Let me just show you how I constructed this file. You know, what's underneath there with that and that. There was just a link hidden here that went back to this view with a slightly different view parameters. To give you that view, all right, there's another one hidden there. It says the general approach for us, empirical, we're pursuing this monstrous goal, monstrously difficult, to by building and trying empirically, and we're approaching it evolutionary-wise because we feel that it's a whole system problem. You need to get a person in that environment working and looking at the many aspects of his working system that are involved in his effectiveness. 
That's many more things than just these computer-aided tools. In a large system like that, we need to do it evolutionary-wise because we can't be analytic enough about it at any one point to decide what best our next thing should be. We can only decide from here, as well as we can analyze it, where we can invest our next resources to get the most return at an increase of the effectiveness of the system we have. And this item down here is the term bootstrapped and applied in a slightly new sense. We're applying that to our approach where we're saying we need a, a research subject group to give them these tools, put them to work with them, study them, and improve them. Uh -huh. We'll do that by making ourselves be the subject group and studying ourselves and making the tools so that they improve our ability to develop and study these kinds of systems and to produce, in the end, this kind of system discipline. So it's been a, it's a struggle doing it that way, but it's beginning to pay off. Now, I've given you an overall picture about the program, and that's out of the way, and I can just move my marker down and say, let's save that version. So, this tool, in pursuing those goals, one of our principal tools is this computer aid system. Let's talk about it as a system. There's a link sequence to jump in there, too. When we talk about NLS, meaning the online system, a very general term, it's going to be NLS for many, many years, an online system that has evolved. Right now, we consider it to be primarily an instrument and a vehicle for helping humans to operate within the domain of complex information structures. Well, we, what do we mean by operate? Well, compose, study, modify is the place we started now. We know that many of the analytic things you can do, but we want to get around, study, and modify. And then to further information about what does complex structure mean, we're talking about complex structure and emphasizing structure because we say, although the content represents your concepts, there's a structural relationship between that content entities that should represent the relationship between the concepts of human thought. All right, we know can do that very well with linear text. So inside the computer, we can represent that quite well. In fact, we can represent information structures in a computer that would generally be far too complex for you to study directly. But NLS serves as a tool to roam over that, navigate through a complex structure, be able to find your way and be navigating, move about it rapidly, and be able to see what you want to see at any given point. That's how we think of NLS as a tool. All right, these are all very important concepts to us because these together with bootstrapping have told us where to start. We start by building an instrument that we can sit at and work during our day to organize the kind of working information we need as a task force developing systems. We need to write our specifications, our plans, our programs, our user's guides, our documentation, our reports, and even our proposals. You can stop the video now. Not bad for three decades ago, huh? Yeah. Um, right at the end, you could see it flickering like it was uh, wanting to die, but it didn't. Uh, one of the interesting things was that Doug was able to actually give that whole presentation, and in his ear, he was hearing, he had an earphone, he was hearing all of the discussion behind the scenes of, oh, this isn't working, oh, get that ready. <laughs> and <laughs> and he, was able, he was able to maintain his composure. It was really amazing. So um, if I may have the next slide, please. History is always told from a particular perspective, so I, I make no bones about the fact that this is from my perspective. And uh, I was had the honor of being with Doug uh, from roughly uh, early, the beginning of 69 to 75, and so uh, I do try to focus primarily on, on roughly that time frame, uh, a little bit before, but not much after. Um, so let me let me just talk a little bit about my view of, of what Doug contributed and, and what the group in general contributed to the industry. 
Um, Doug obviously was the visionary, and uh, it was sort of my job during m much of this time to sort of be the intermediary between Doug and, and all of the programmers who were supposed to be able to make this work. And uh, it, was, it was quite a challenge to understand what Doug was talking about. And these concepts may seem kind of normal today, uh, but at that time they were pretty bizarre. And I'll go through uh, some, some of the context of the time just to give you a feeling for, for how, uh, how advanced Doug's thinking actually was at the time. Obviously, he formed the group. He uh, got the uh, organization, S SRI and, and ARPA and others, to support it and, and uh, of course, got funding for it. And he was also the chief spokes spokesperson for the group. But fundamentally, his contribution was the basic theory of what we were trying to do and the direction of the group and how we made successively uh, improved steps all along the way to, to uh, move it forward. And fundamentally to set this goal of, of working on this generic problem of making it possible for humans to do a better job of dealing with complex intellectual pursuits. Next slide. <coughs> so you, you heard uh, Jeff earlier in the videotape talk about this human system versus tool system paradigm. And this is one of the things that I think was very unique about uh, what Doug was doing, and I haven't really seen much of this uh, elsewhere in, in the industry. There's a little bit at the Institute for the Future, but, but mostly this is uh, something that's generally ignored in the industry, where you have to co-evolve the, the human side of things, the organization, the procedures, the cultures, the disciplines that we have, how we talk about things, and the, the amount of, and degree of training that we, that we undergo. To, to establish the skills and knowledge and so forth that we need. And that, that has to change as you introduce new, new kinds of tools that allow you to do things in different ways. And so Doug always had this in the forefront and uh, it's one of the strong lessons that I think all of us who worked on it learned uh, from Doug, uh, even though it wasn't carried on, as I said, very much in, in other contexts. Next slide, please. <coughs> So one of the main things that Doug did was uh, force us to think about computers not as number crunchers, which was the, the way people thought about computers at that time, and really focus it on manipulating symbols so that it became part of the human thought process, which meant that the response time had to be really high because it had to work at the same level that your brain was working. But he had this basic structure uh, that, that uh, guided how we did things, um, where basically he wanted a comprehensive but open user interface where we could expand the vocabulary over time, introduce more and more things. And he wanted to be able to manipulate content and the relationships of content to each other. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't just an issue of, of the words or the pictures and words, it was how that information related to other information. And obviously, integrating text to, and graphics together was, was important because that helped communicate. Uh, with the notion of inter and intra document links, which is common in the web today, but as of a few years ago, it was hard to even explain to people what that meant. Uh, but it was used, obviously, to great, to great extent, as you saw in the demo that just finished. With a v rich way of navigating around among all of this information uh, that got built up by you and your colleagues, uh, with a structure that allowed multiple documents in multiple windows so that you could both view related material that was, happened to be in different documents and also edit across document boundaries. And also, obviously, the user had to have a very rich control mechanism for how things got presented to him. And uh, often what Doug calls views or uh, view specs uh, was the actual mechanism that allowed people to very facilely change the way the, the information was being displayed. Next slide, please. So what was going on in the late 60s? Um, well, the ARPANET was just conceived, and as you heard, the second node of the ARPANET, the, the thing that actually made it a network, uh, actually happened here. And so we were actually able to, to uh, do our first communication with UCLA. But it, it was just a, a thought, basically. We had a, a lot of research institutions around the country that were all doing independent things. And ARPA had the wisdom to try to hook them all together so that we could share value uh, generated in one uh, in another. Uh, the Network Information Center, as was discussed by Jeff, uh, was needed. We needed a way to, to centrally control a lot of the development that was going on in the ARPA network. But the main way that people dealt with computers was through hard copy teletypes, mostly capital letters, 
Uh, the only kind of text editing capability that, that exists on any computers at that time was essentially line by line editors where you moved an imaginary uh, cursor around in a line and, and edited uh, words and characters that are, uh, out of it or into it. Uh, there was some text formatting, uh, so you could get reasonably looking, reasonable looking documents by putting some embedded codes in. And there was some early, early work by uh, Van Dam and, um, and Nelson at Brown University on hypertext, which in my mind relates more to what we think of as undo today than what hypertext now means, which is much more what uh, Doug's links were all about. And out in the wide world, there was, you know, the hippies and love generation and all of that. It was a very strange time. <laughs> Next slide. So, so, Obviously, Doug gets a lot of the credit for the work that's done here, but in fact, it's any, any significant endeavor like this involves the work of a lot of different people. So I've tried to just here try to capture in the next three slides some of the things that, that I believe came out of this work uh, by a group of very talented people, obviously led by Doug, but uh, each individual in the group all making rather significant contributions. Well, first of all, uh, this was the first system that I know of where there was a comprehensive user interface where uh, the whole system was embodied in one paradigm, one model for how to, how to do things. Uh, we had all f actually developed a, a formal language for describing the user interface and there was a formal mechanism for interpreting that so you could actually reload grammars and change the user interface almost instantly. Uh, so it allowed us a lot of flexibility in, in what we were doing at the user interface level. Uh, obviously, the structured documents and multiple data types all integrated together into one document um, happened at this time. <clears throat> the facile view presentation filters that uh, Doug was using in the, in the film there uh, was a quite important part of this and it still isn't available anywhere today. Uh, advanced formatting controls for printing, it was still embedded controls, but it was carried to a much greater degree than anywhere else. Uh, there was this integrated cataloged email system called the journal. Uh, which was a repository of most of the m email that was sent around among the members of the group, and you could link to it, and it became a permanent repository, and hence you had this ability to build on ideas and build on ideas and know that the links that you had to this uh, earlier information were, were good forever, and uh, even those ideas uh, still are not available today. <coughs> there were shared screens for teleconferencing. There's a segment of this video a little bit later where some of that's demonstrated, which we could show. Uh, after this is over, if people want, uh, <clears throat> that actually allowed you to uh, look at it. At two, two, or, two or more individuals could actually look at the same content on the screen. You each had a pointer. You could pass control back and forth. Uh, you could even, using the video system, do video inserts and see the other person in real time, uh, carry on conversations and edit and view things together. Uh, even today, this is fairly hard to do. Next slide, please. As far as I know, this is the first system that had a completely integrated help system so that you could at any time uh, find out what was going on and how, how to get out of whatever jam you were in. Um, the, uh, this was a, a system where we used the, sorry about that, uh, we used the system extensively to do our software development and as a result of that, uh, we really pushed the frontiers of software engineering uh, quite far down the road. And there were a lot of really good software engineering uh, system ideas that came out of this time. Uh, there was a very strong focus on, on very rapid response times, as I said. Uh, early use of programmable microprocessors. We were one of the first organizations on the planet to use the then uh, brand new uh, 4004 from Intel. It was a four-bit uh, microprogrammed uh, computer. And we actually built a whole system out of those things which was quite hard. There were no development tools. It was really difficult. Um, and uh, we also had a preview mode. WYSIWYG is a term that got coined later at PARC for what you see is what you get. But uh, we actually had a WYSIWYG preview mode uh, in, in NLS. And we also did the pioneering work on the remote procedure call. Uh, a fellow named Jim White did that here. Well, a number of the people, next slide please, a number of the people in this organization uh, went on to uh, Xerox PARC, so I did want to try to cover some of the things that transferred to PARC and some of the things that didn't. Okay. There you go. So there was a, 
at PARC, obviously, a very strong focus on documents and on text viewing and ma manipulation. I don't think that was due to SGI. It was partly the context and, and the culture at, at Xerox. Um, but it, this was clearly something that transferred over and, and was uh, pushed a long ways at Xerox. Uh, the mouse-based integrated 2D graphic user interface obviously uh, carried over. In fact, there was an actual implementation of a subset of, of uh, NLS called UGG uh, done at PARC that um, actually in many ways was uh, what everybody thought NLS was. When you went, when you went to Zara's Park and you talked about NLS, they all thought it was this program called UGG, which was probably only maybe a third of what NLS was uh, and was implemented in, in a slightly different way. So, I mean, it, people had kind of a skewed view of things. Uh, we did carry on the work with the uh, remote procedure call style of network architecture. We developed a new form called Courier. In fact, Jim White uh, did that work again. Uh, obviously pushed the notion of windows and overlapping windows and cross-document editing uh, a lot further. Uh, integrated the help system. Had, we had uh, developed something, uh, Bill Paxson and, and I to some extent, uh, had developed a modular programming system here at SRI and that got transferred to Xerox and became what was later called Mesa. And uh, we also had obviously a lot of work uh, at SRI in terms of integrating uh, different data types together into documents and that was pushed a lot further at SRI, at, uh, I mean at Xerox. And there was some work in shared screen teleconferencing uh, built into some of the applications that were done at Xerox. Next slide please. There were also a set of things that for some reason didn't make it into Xerox and, uh, and in fact as far as I know didn't make it into anywhere else. Um, this, as I said earlier, this, this focus on the human system and the tool system evolving together uh, has just not been pushed very much anywhere. Uh, the notion of structured files and filters and views and so forth uh, didn't, didn't make it. Uh, the formatting of user, uh, uh, of user documents by embedding codes obviously did get pursued elsewhere. Uh, in fact, HTML is a, is a version of this today. Uh, but Xerox really focused on editing in the formatted view, what was called WYSIWYG editing. And so um, the, the format controls just weren't visible to the user in the same way. So that, that's a, that was a real advance, I believe, at Xerox. Uh, integrated email repository, uh, as far as I know, hasn't been done anywhere. And uh, hypermedia and links, uh, for some reason, just didn't catch on at Xerox. And that really didn't become popularized until just a few years ago when the World Wide Web came on the scene. Uh, notion of a programmable user interface uh, wasn't really pursued, and obviously the key set didn't make it, even though the mouse did. Next slide, please. On the other hand, there, there were a lot of really stellar contributions from Xerox PARC as well, and obviously the bitmap-based uh, personal computer, Smalltalk, and the UI that was developed for that, uh, a lot of which was copied in, in the STAR. Star Workstation and Servers was a complete integrated system and uh, borrowed a lot of ideas from the early work here at, at uh, SRI and from other research efforts at Xerox. The Ethernet, the laser printing, WYSIWYG editors, and the cut, cut and paste editing paradigm all came out of that time. <coughs> the, the style of having a prefixed user interface, in other words, of specifying the operands first and then the operator, uh, was another big improvement that happened at this time. Uh, the style, as you might have noticed when Doug was doing his demonstration, that NLS had was what you might think of as an infix or, or a prefix kind of notation where you specify the commands. Now, that afforded a real economy in terms of identifying the operands because you already knew the state and you could uh, apply whatever semantics were appropriate at the, uh, with a single click. But on the other hand, if anything went wrong, it's sort of like dialing a telephone number and then realizing you got it wrong and you have to start it all over again. That was the way this worked too. You had, you could either confirm the command or abort it, but there was, it was very hard to back up and do anything else. Um, the client-server distributed architecture, uh, system architecture, uh, was pushed, I think, a great, di great distance uh, by the folks at Park, and the uh, Mesa development environment was was really a huge step forward. And uh, this was, as far as I know, the earliest large-scale implementation of an intranet. I don't know, um, by the time I left Xerox in 82, it was, it was thousands and thousands of Alto and Star workstations on multiple Ethernets all hooked together into a big internet. It was, uh, it was a real learning experience for everybody. 
Sometimes it didn't work so great. Um, and uh, also the notion of a user's conceptual model as a fundamental design methodology for doing system and user interface design was uh, pioneered at this time. And of course, uh, in the last few years, World Wide Web has come on the scene, and, and this whole notion of interdocument links and so forth have, have uh, become very popular, and people use them routinely today. And that's wonderfully uh, rewarding to all of us who did the pioneering work on this so long ago. It's astonishing that it took this long to uh, become popular, but uh, it's wonderful that it has. Uh, the links that were in NLS allowed you to talk about uh, locations within documents, not just the beginning. And uh, the, the uh, World Wide Web does have this notion of, of linking within documents once you're in a document or a page, as it's called there. Uh, but it's, uh, it's quite limited compared to what uh, NLS did, and there's still no notion of views and so forth. Uh, but it does have open and integrated data types, and all of that's uh, a real advance over what we had back in the 60s and 70s. Um, there's some integration with email, at least with Netscape, and, and uh, so there's hope there that some of that will eventually become very strong. And the document um, page orientation is certainly very similar to what we were doing back in the ARC days. Obviously, the whole set of protocols and file formats and so forth that, are, uh, that have evolved there, and that's really good, and JavaScript and network computers and all of that, and Java. So that's kind of where we are today. Uh, from my point of view, uh, Doug and the Augmentation Research Center really did have a profound impact. And uh, when you look back 30 years, it's kind of astonishing how little advance there has been over the last three decades. Um, but you can certainly see the roots of an awful lot of what we think of as the modern computer environment uh, right back there. And Doug uh, was uh, just a steadfast uh, leader and visionary for the group. And although we went through some pretty tough times at, at uh, moments, uh, his leadership and inspiration was, was really admirable. Uh, but as I said, any, any significant contribution involves lots of different people. And some of them, including Bill English and, and Jeff Rillison, uh, made major contributions to what we were doing here. And there's still a lot to come. And I just want to close with this last slide. Uh, these are just some things that occur to me that, that seem to me to still be lacking in the industry. Uh, hypertext integration of email repository I've already talked about. I think if we could build that kind of mechanism or some kind of collaborative uh, use of email along with the hypertext mechanisms, it would be really great, uh, especially if it could involve some kind of annotation or something. Uh, more use of the structure of information rather than just the, the text or pictures themselves. More seamless integration of databases, I think, would be a big help. You can see a lot of that in some uh, more advanced web pages today. I think you'll see a huge amount of it over the next few years. Uh, more use of some presentation controls so you can move around in, in information more facilely would be really great. Uh, better teleconferencing or video conferencing with uh, better screen sharing and, and editing and viewing together. I think, especially with regard to devices that are trying to view web content on televisions, that you're going to see a lot more use of animation and video and, and streaming audio to make it seem more television-like and less computer-like. And for, hopefully, there'll be more focus on the human system evolution uh, as well as the tool system. Thanks a lot. sort of tell you two things. One is uh, uh, after some of the history, there, there are a lot of things that are hard to explain about that era because you have to sort of know what it was like in those days and what people were thinking about. And uh, it's like I was all settled when I got my PhD at Berkeley. I'd stay there and do the research that I had planned to do. But some older hand at a, at a party one Saturday afternoon was telling me, well, he was from a different department. He says, you know, I listened to you a while, and you know what I think? He says, as long as you go around talking about using computers interactively like that, you know that universities advance you according to peer perception and review. And so if you keep pointing like this, I'll guarantee you'll be an acting assistant professor forever. And um, so, oh. 
So I really believed him. So I decided I'd, I'd move down here to SRI because I, I said if any management in the world would buy it, then I could probably do it here. So I came for my first interview day, and the first person I talked to was Torben Meisling, who I had known. He got to his PhD a few years before I did up there. And so I stopped to talk to him, and he listened to all this, and he says, well, have you interviewed anybody else yet? No, you're the first one. Well, I advise you, Doug, well, just tell them about the patents that came out of your PhD work and such, and, and don't tell them about this. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, and I got hired. <laughs> and I got, and it, was, it was hard, so I needed to work for my room and board, and so it, it, you know, I was lucky to getting to work for a while with Ukraine and, and all that area like that, and stumbled on some good ideas there. And, and finally I built up enough credibility that I could start doing what I sort of wanted to do. And I even found an Air Force Office of Scientific Research that would grip stake very out, out front things. Well, I was very proud of that for a while, and then I began to find out who else they'd supported. And here was some guy that was studying the way gnats fly together and what keeps them bound. And I said, oh, that's the kind of a thing they think I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I was trying out those ideas then in the late 50s, and, and uh, I kept having this experience of, of talking to somebody from another discipline, like psychology. I really thought I'd get him interested. The guy looked at it for a while and just says, well, there's something called cognitive psychology coming on. I said, but you don't have any kind of background to be talking about what you're doing like that, so you better stick to being an engineer. See? Or one time I got invited to come over and address a group at Stanford had this uh, institute for uh, advanced study in uh, liberal arts or something. And so I was talking to them about all this interaction and things. And afterwards, three of them, four of them, I guess, asked me to come out and sit out in the patio on a round picnic table-like thing. They want to talk to me. Oh, gee, great. So I very soon picked up the feeling that they were really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that they were information retrieval people. And they said, all you're talking about is information retrieval. And look, we're professionals in that. And so it really galls us when you come along and tell us about computers and things like that. We already know how you run computers to do information retrieval and such. You're just, boy, they were just, they were angry. <laughs> then I read a really interesting report from, from Rand by a couple of executives that said, there's a basic problem in doing multi, multi, uh, disciplinary con research projects. They said, there's something called a conceptual framework. Later it would have been called a paradigm. Conceptual framework that everybody sort of absorbs in their professional education and training. And each discipline has a different conceptual framework. So you bundle all these people together in a common project, and they're all going to be looking at it from their framework. And it says, until you search around for a while and get a common conceptual framework, you're not going to really get those disciplines doing together. And I says, ah, psychology, information retrieval, uh, other people, I begin to get it. So let me see if I can develop a, an appropriate conceptual framework. So I got some grant from the Air Force and spent a couple of years, pretty much. Um, SRI by then had sort of let me do some overhead because I had gotten a bunch of patents and things. And, but pretty soon they were wanting to know what I was doing. So <laughs> I wrote a little think piece and I gave it to my manager at the lab and he looked at it a while, then he sighed and he pushed it away and he says, Doug, I've read four or five pages and I still don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> if you looked at it now, it, it, you'd say, oh, I was just describing how you could do word processing and things with a computer. But he says, look, here's an example. Here, Bill wrote a proposal. And it was uh, Bill Couts. See? One page. First paragraph defines a problem. Second problem s paragraph says what they want to do about it. And third says the kind of conclusions he thinks he could get. Well, I looked at that and I really realized there's already a vocabulary and a whole set of concepts in the switching theory area like that. So yes, bing, 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 you can really define it. Here, I'm talking about something in which there was no established vocabulary, no established set of concepts like that. The very idea of using a computer interactively was just off the spall because computers were very expensive, running for number crunching, et cetera, like that. 
Uh, a couple of years later, I'd be talking to people, and I said, look, it's inevitable that every knowledge worker is going to be having a display, interactive, in this desk all the time. And that would just pfft off. So it was, you know, it's, it, you might think it's fun to be a visionary, but really it's a hell of a thing. <laughs> Really, it's, it's um, you know, so it just, it just, it's gone on and on. And uh, so for a while, you sort of feel like they're picking on you. And then, uh, then one time, I, I started reading about paradigms and this conceptual framework stuff. And I realized, okay, uh, basically I was just outside the prevailing paradigms. And... It's sort of like if you bring a product to the market and the market isn't ready for it, it's not the market's fault. See? So if I bring some concepts into the world like that, that it's outside the prevailing paradigm, it's not their fault see? that they don't buy it or see it. So then that's really started me thinking a lot more about, okay, how, how do paradigms get shifted? And how, how if times are changing very, very rapidly, and it becomes imperative that we start adapting our prevailing paradigms to fit the actual environments and situations. It's something that we all, all absorb uh, without recognizing it, and we all exercise our paradigm without recognizing what it is, etc. So what I, uh, what I show you here is if you if you want to go browsing sometime and you go www.bootstrap.org, it'll get to what the Bootstrap Institute is. And here you can look at a bunch of the publications that are there. And uh, there, there are articles that get written and... Uh, oh, that's far me, I guess. <laughs> so here are a bunch of articles dated from 1992 going back to 73 and there are earlier ones too in here going back to... 1962 is on there now, the research center. So this is a sort of a thing as I struggled through those years and came out with this, this report called Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. And it really tried to build that conceptual framework and it's steered me ever since. So out of that came some of the things Charles was talking about, et cetera, and, and more. And then a line of papers and reports going on up to here like this, that if anyone cares to go there to, uh, to sort of follow suit would be, uh, you'd be welcome to read it, but there's a lot there. And um, um, I think what I'd like to do is, is um, start showing you some of this. There's a Macromedia director, oh, Tim Lenoir, I should inter tell you about him. It's Professor Tim Lenoir. At, he's head of the, let's see, uh, Philosophy and History of Science program at Stanford. And the poor misguided guy has gone and gotten a grant from the Sloan Foundation to do a special study of this laboratory, of the Augmentation Research Center. At that. So he's putting stuff on his website that um, there, there's a lot of the archival materials coming from our lab that, that got picked up at Stanford in their uh, history of science archives. So he's converting some of that in there. And I guess Charles donated a whole bunch of the reports that he walked off with from our lab <laughs> there. <laughs> and, uh, and we, uh, so Tim, I forgot to, I forgot to highlight his uh, um, website. How do we get that to them, Tim? Did he leave already? No, we can get, we can get it later. Yeah, all right. But anyway, that's very important. So this, this kind of thing that in... How did, how did I get to this place I'm going to talk about here? Uh, through this, by 1974, it was pretty clear to me that we had to get real users involved besides our own real users. So we took a big gamble and started supporting people across the ARPANET and we actually set up a support system, and we actually hired some nice young liberal arts trained females uh, to be trainers. Because we didn't want programmers out there trying to scare people by telling them this is what you do with these tools. So we started selling service to organizations that wanted to try this sort of thing. And in those days, you'd have to explain 
really, this is what a file is on mind. Da, da, da. But so we were really getting a lot of good experience in that, and uh, we actually had some whole, whole way in which we kind of, we, we said, you're going to talk about your knowledge workshop, and we're talking about an augmented knowledge workshop, and you need an architect for that workshop. And so if we're going to sell you services, we want you to assign somebody to represent your group that we work with, and that person is going to be the architect, and we bring the tools, a lot of experience, and that's the funnel through that. So then we even got a, we, we organized those archi the knowledge workshop architects into a community, we call them, see? So that was the knowledge workshop architect community. And people said, you can't label that, because pretty soon they're going to call them quacks. <laughs> well, it turned out everybody in that community loved the term. <laughs> so there was the quack community. And we got a long way, but lots of other people got interested in computers and interactions by the mid-70s, and the term then was office automation. And we were just no way of telling them about the difference between augmenting and automating. So you automate, you just come in and help to get the computer to help you do the task you used to do. If you're augmenting, you're changing the way you work, et cetera, so you can harness that. We couldn't even make people listen. Artificial intelligence sort of people started getting in the act, and they had their idea about a computer getting to be smart enough that it interfaced with you, the user, and you wouldn't have to learn anything because it would build a model of what you were like, and not like NLS over there. So our ratings just plummeted. And so it came to the point in the 76, 77 that we lost all our support, and um, et cetera. So that was just, the lab got closed. So the only way I could save what we built was to try to get the commercial world to buy from SRI the rights to use this NLS system. So we got a taker called Timeshare. And so they set up an office automation division, as much as I hated that term. <laughs> and so we carried on with that same business there. And six years later, McDonnell Douglas bought Timeshare and TimeNet in an acquisition move to put together about a billion dollar a year revenue information systems group. So way down in there was this, this office automation group with thing that had been renamed Augment and continued to evolve and using, you know, really supporting pretty massive kinds of users. We had something like 20 mainframe DEC20 servers around the country supporting thousands of people all together using with, you know, thin client, <laughs> client server relationships working in there with a whole bunch of advanced collaboration and, and uh, uh, workflow stuff. So it was really very advanced, but what I got to do was to go knocking on the door in McDonnell Douglas as a cousin, or, you know, I was related. I wasn't a vendor coming in. And uh, so I, I got to go right inside the big, heavy design processes for designing aircraft and even the talking about the maintenance and the manufacturing. And I brought these ideas in there like that. And oh, boy, some of them just really ate it up. Because here's the way you can coordinate big, complex designs. And we even got the concept started about having links from you know what the structured document we have, a link could aim to a CAD system. And when it gets there, it's got enough stuff that it evokes the, the uh, right kind of macro operations inside the CAD system. So that creates the image you wanted to, and boom. So you would be able to see that, and it could cut that out and send it back to you if you wanted to. So, see, so you could, your link inside your text could point to a particular view inside of a CAD system. Well, we've been doing this all from the start. You point to a document and a particular view is what the view specification that goes along with the address. So then inside the CAD systems, you could, you could have specifications in a complex drawing like that, that, okay, you, you could click on something there. It'd be a link going off to a document that had the specifications for you or the requirements. So it could integrate a lot more of that. And so the people got so excited about that 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 we would try to go up to the guy who was a corporate vice president for, for doing uh, information resources. Well, I don't know you guys. So one time he said, if you, you need a pony to ride, you go over and get these guys in this, this project over here interested, and then maybe I'll talk to you. So a year later, we'd spent a lot of time, gotten them interested, got project management methods, et cetera, that they just loved. 
instead of working, came back to the guy and he says, sorry, well, I've changed my mind. I don't think, I think we ought to buy instead of build. <laughs> and besides, he says, if, if IBM and DEC and Hewlett Packard aren't doing things like this, I, I ain't going to buy into it. So, so we kept bumping into all that, and we tried approaching each of those companies, each, DEC, IBM, uh, Hill Packard, Apple, Sun, at various times through that period like that, but all this, this stuff we were doing just did not sit with their picture of the marketplace, so it was pretty hard. So the thing we'd learned by the late 80s inside of McDonnell Douglas was the only way all this kind of stuff would get going is to get a multi-user organizations together because you have to set standards on the structure and content and properties of your hyper documents and you can't do that just from one vendor so we tried from inside and that wasn't working well so one of my daughters who'd worked with me a lot and she and her husband had just had their startup crash so uh, they helped me start the Bootstrap Institute, and she's been working ever since like this with the idea of, hey, look, there's an approach. So I'd like to tell you about that approach, and that's Christina down here like this. And uh, the, uh, this thing of paradigms all the time, um, you know, it's, it's a very critical matter, and you, you have to empathize with other people's paradigms because they're just as much <laughs> theirs as anything. And all you have to do is think of the times in which somebody was trying to tell you something and you just sort of say, you know, look, if you can't say it in terms that are meaningful to me and, and so on like that, I, I don't want to listen to all that. It just doesn't seem relevant. So, so the day I realized I'd been hearing people like that through that same way, and I realized we all have that paradigm. So the issue is I start isolating what are the kinds of thinking domains in which what we'd gotten going were shifted the paradigms of those domains? And this ended up with this map that each of these boxes around here is, is a sort of element of a paradigm shift. And uh, so this macromedia director presentation that's grown like that is very, very flexible because I can, I can just go around and talk about these boxes if I want and highlight them. Or I can say, oh, when I click on it, I'd like to see what's underneath it on the first level. Or I can click on it in another mode, and it'll go down and follow a path to a bunch of frames and come back to a final picture. So I can use this and just give you very quick overviews, or I can spend a day and a half diving into that stuff. So I just brought up, so don't worry. <laughs> anyway, it's just to show you a few of the things in in there that did it. Well, I'll dive down here because this coping with complexity and urgency collectively was a thing that triggered me in the spring of 1951 that just changed me totally. You know, that I think I, the, the world's going to face more and more complexity with more and more urgency and have to be dealt with collectively and our our collective capability to deal with complex, urgent things is not increasing as fast as the complexity and urgency are. So is there any way to go after that? So that's when I got the image of working interactively with computers, et cetera, and wow. So I, uh, I was a engineer. I didn't know anything about computers except I'd read a book and said that they could punch cards and print on paper. I'd been a radar technician in World War II, so I knew that and these digital circuits could put things on a display, and I knew they watched the operator. I knew all the circuits, so I knew a computer could watch an operator, and I knew a computer could do anything you want on a display if it could print cards and punch cards and print paper. So, bingo. So you could have all kinds of new symbologies that you could employ because that can construct them so much faster than you can do it by hand. So they just change a lot. So I went to Berkeley to get a PhD because they were building a computer, and uh, they never got it finished all the time I was there. <laughs> so you heard me tell why I left there. But anyway, this objective is in there, and, and one interesting thought about that came about is you don't just change organizations and some turn a switch on some high-level capability, core competency, and increase that, that when you're really talking about change, you're talking about a whole capability infrastructure that you're changing. And here, this augmentation system thing came in there that you 
you, you've got to have both of those. If we go down into there in a minute, it was this kind of a picture. So it's very nearly the one I do for myself in 61, with all these there and saying, your capability infrastructure is derived by these things being added to the human's repertoire to sit on top of your basic mental, perceptual, sensory, motor kind of capabilities, which you've learned how to harness into this stuff. And that in the 50, late 50s, I'd done a scaling study of dimensional scaling. I just happened to be thinking about that and got a grant from an Air Force group about looking at electronic componentry. And if you can scale them down, what's the advantage? So semiconductors are just coming out. There's just some bare talk about that being scaled down and into in integrated circuits. So when I did that study, it was a real, real lesson because uh, you don't, you, you realize in the physical scaling of things, you're used to looking at phenomena, what happens when you fall, what happens when you drop something, many things like that. You're used to them and you don't think about it, that most of those things are a function of how big you are. That if you're an eighth of an inch tall, you know, gravity has almost no effect on you. If you're 28 feet tall, boy, you, you, you'd have to be built very differently in order to be able to walk even, like an elephant, you have to be much bigger. That the strength of any kind of object is depending on its cross-sectional area. So your muscles and your bones, the strength of them depending on the area. If you were 10 times bigger, oh, they'd be 100 times as strong. Hey, good deal. Oh, but you're 1,000 times the volume. Oh, you'd be 1,000 times as heavy and only 100 times as strong. Well, I'm sorry, but most of us aren't, don't have safety factors of 10 to 1 in our strength. <laughs> so uh, the surprise angle there was just built into me in studying all the things. Incidentally, I became totally convinced that, that electronics would change all sorts of ways as you moved into new, smaller scales, and that we'd find phenomena to harness at those smaller scales just inevitably with the pressure they'd be on, so that you'd have all the computational and storage capacity you ever dreamed of inevitably, see. So this is what the nanotechnology guys tell me now. Be able to hold in your hand all the processing and storage that say maybe in the whole world today or something. Those, if it's not that, it's everything in, in California. So who cares? It's, um, <laughs> so anyway, so this kind of changes. So when I looked at this picture very much from that scaling point of view and realized all that thing about digital technology and uh, all this stuff that's going to change in there and how pervasive the impact was going to be throughout the whole human system and for it to start harnessing this instead of looking to where we go in here and, and, and automate, it's where do you change these things so we can really harness this towards human ends. Oh boy, the candidates for change are just going to be surprising to us all. Okay, let's get started. So the language aspect of that's what really appealed to me like that because this is changing your intellectual processes. So you say, okay, we do things inside our mind. We found out that one part of the reason our brain is unusual is because it can actually form concepts. And then it later found that you could tie symbols to those in language, verbal languages. And then later we saw we could find out how to make visual symbols on paper and clay and such as that so that you can externalize the symbols representing your concepts. Boy, big evolution. All right, now what if you externalize those inside a computer? The computer can help you in the process of externalizing them. The computer can help you store them. The computer can help you make structures in there that much more easily match the syntax of your sentences as well as the structure of your arguments, etc. Oh, wow, it could, it could make any kind of, well, I guess you've heard me say that before, but anyway. <laughs> That's what the whole thing about hypertext, hypermedia, linkage, structures, stuff like that just came out of that and says, boy, that would be so valuable to go after that it's just important that we do it. So anyway, then a thing that evolves from that is to say, well, let's look. You sort of can put up a two-dimensional image here of the tool systems expanding and improving that direction, the human system changing there, and because of this huge eruption in digital technology, this now, this anticipatable boundary out here of the kinds of technology you could bring into harness is way out there. And with that goes all kinds of changes potential in your human system. And yet organizations are stuck down here. 
So the marketplace hovers around here and saying, you know, we look at what organizations are ready to do, we can do a lot of good things, etc., and people are going to start moving, and people haven't moved very far out of this first sector like that. And yet, this whole frontier is facing us, and it's facing what, every big organization, your institutions, the, the whole educational institution, the governance institution, the economic institutions, etc. So, all those things are going to have to move out through there. And it's a very tricky area that nobody really has scouted. Well, you say, people have been telling me for years, Doug, you just don't understand. The market's going to take care of it. And I says, oh, you know, any of you that are engineers or physicists know that if you're trying to find, sort of opt optimize something in a multi-dimensional field, you've got to watch that you don't start finding some local maximum. That means you run all around, you find a local hill. I, I've got the maximum. Yeah, but there's a bigger hill over here you missed. So that's the kind of thing we have here, that the marketplace isn't a machine. It climbs a hill very well, but it's not very good exploring this. And you say, oh, oh nonsense. Well, all right, you say, how come the personal computers totally ignored the networks, you know, for a decade at least? That's a decade of lost opportunity for society to, to be oriented about how valuable all that could be, because the ARPANET and the Internet by the 80s was showing a lot of that. We were. So the marketplace just ignored it until, bingo, the, the World Wide Web found a way to leak out and everybody could, could get excited about it. And then the leaders of the market says, aha, you know, we're the network people. So anyway, I, I uh, just say that's something we've just, we've got to have new kind of institutions and we've got to have some way for having frontiers, outposts out there. And this leads to a concept of saying we have to essentially find, get the idea of getting high performance knowledge work teams and put, plugging them in out there and we've got to learn by it and we've got to do some kind of proactive involvement of lots of end user organizations so that they in the marketplace are counterbalancing the kind of market share drive that the vendors have without really considering, they, they have no responsibility to consider the best path in that frontier for the end user organizations. Yeah. So anyway, I have a feeling everyone's getting hungry. <laughs> so this gets down to talking about the collective IQ is a big important thing. And if we look at the end result of going down through its path, you says, oh, any kind of organization has to be very cognizant of the outside world and bring that information into an intelligence collection. It has to record its dialogue and has to have a knowledge product that's a viable, dynamic thing at any given time. And so the IQ of that organizational unit like that is just going to be judged by how quickly does it sense what's going on in the outside world, adapt to it, marshal its resources, coordinate them, etc., and go after how smart that collective IQ is. Just it's It's not just a classy term. It's really meaningful to us. Anyway, so we come out to something here. I just have to tell you that uh, the, this missing piece of stuff here, the HTML, is good start, but as Charles was telling about, there's a lot of things in there that we explored and a lot more to go after. If you really, you really have the idea for, for uh, going out in that frontier. So it says, okay, you need this, that. I won't get into that too much. If you start making headway and all that, you have to think about how you're going to deploy that. One very important thing is to employ in improvement communities. Because the thing we had talked about here is every organization has an infrastructure of capabilities. Well, you look over there and say, hey, one subordinate part of that is its, sub its infrastructure for improving itself. Well, if you organize that appropriately, you can say, ah, you can get this bootstrapping. You can say, hey, if I pick this, for instance, as something to really go after, I can improve my improvement infrastructure at the same time improving the whole one, and I'm getting this compound return that we were talking about in here, see? So he says, okay, so that's what ends up this networked improvement communities. And you can say, well, any consortium, any scientific community, you know, any... Uh, any or, I mean, there are just lots of these improvement communities. So we're saying, okay, we're going to set up a special kind of improvement community 
that when it's networked, it means it's doing this, that this now is your networked improvement community by really modernize it like that. So he says, okay, so that's what a label for a networked improvement community is. So we're now saying, okay, we're launching what's called the Bootstrap Alliance, which is a networked improvement communities <coughs> whose members are improvement communities who are going to turn into advanced networked improvement communities, be doing their internal improvement in advance. Well, the National Science Foundation says, oh, great, because every science community we have is an improvement community. If it turns into a NIC, like inevitably will, great. So anyway, this is what we're doing, and next week we're having a meeting in, in Washington in which we have the National Association of State Universities and Land Grant Colleges as an improvement community there that's going to start plan telling how it could change to a NIC. We're having a, the Society for International Development coming to say how could we turn into a, a NIC so that international development could be accelerated. So we're finding a number of things like that getting together, and that's, that's excitement on our stage. So uh, this, this vector we started way back is, is still going, and it'll be going as long as I can stay going myself. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess what do we do? Go ask, go get, go out for refreshments and Yeah, we'll have questions. refreshments outside, and if you have questions for the speakers, please join them outside of the hotel. Thank you. 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 Thank you.